So I sat down remotely with Dr. Jeffrey Snedeker recently, who is currently professor of French horn at Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington. He also teaches courses in music history, brass pedagogy, brass literature, and other courses here and there. For a full view of his career and of his accomplishments, you can find several bios online about him, but I'll just describe a few things here. He received first place in the Natural Horn Division of the 1991 American Horn Competition. He's recorded several albums on modern horn, natural horn, and jazz horn. It's a little silly to differentiate between modern horn and jazz horn, but we kind of do that. He's regularly published as a scholar and as a writer. For example, you can find some of his publications in the New Grove Music Dictionary, which is pretty cool. And he has served several terms as the president of the International Horn Society. That's right, president. I received an undergraduate degree in horn performance from Central, and so, of course, I had to spend a lot of time working with him. And in my lessons, we would often start conversing, even when we were supposed to be playing. And in many of those instances, that may have been me attempting to hide the fact that I hadn't prepared adequately for the lesson. And notice I say attempted. It be it's become pretty clear that he knows when we don't prepare more than we might realize. We spend a majority of the conversation exploring his 20s, his undergraduate degree and his graduate studies and the stuff between. Whether you're a young person, uh, an aspiring musician, a horn player, a music teacher, or if you're you somehow stumbled upon this due to the randomness, the seeming randomness of YouTube algorithms. I think Dr. Snedeker has a lot of interesting stuff to say, and I'm glad I was able to share it in this format. So I hope you enjoy this. Thank you, Dr. Snedeker, for joining me on whatever this thing is. I still don't know what it is, but I'm really happy to have you on. Well, thanks. I, uh, I, I'm honored that you would still want to talk to me after four <laughs> years of, you know, what we've been through together, you know, <laughs> um, by now it's five, five years. Yeah, that's true. So. That's true. It's five years now. That's right. So how, how are you doing? Doing fine. You know, uh, the, I think one of the things that, uh, we all learn is that, um, it's much better and easier in life if you sort of take what you're given and make the most of it instead of worrying about what could have been, should have been, or whatever. We always have uh, these little and sometimes big obstacles that we have to figure out. And so as a result, you know, some things we can control, some things we can't. Um, so if I decide I, I can control my attitude, I'm doing great. <laughs> no, seriously, we just, you know, you figure it out. And, uh, and things are good. Yeah, considering the drastic shift uh, musicians in particular have had to go through, I mean, people people have seemed kind of down in the, the music world, but yeah, there's also well, a lot of positivity. Yeah, and you know what, though? In some ways, rightly so. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that these types of, of uh, situations do when they are so widespread and so serious is they show us where our values are. And it's very frustrating, you know, to have so many arts organizations um, have so much trouble. But um, what I'm hoping, and who knows, is that in the process of going through this, perhaps, you know, our country will realize how valuable the arts are and uh, maybe support it a bit more uh, instead of taking it so much for granted or sort of foisting it on to, well, you know, those artists, you know, they'll have to fend for themselves. You know, interestingly enough, um, you know, artists will fend for themselves and they will find a way. And the interesting thing is that, you know, a lot of folks say that because they want to uh, sort of restrict artists or, or control it somehow or just not pay for it. Um, but Art finds a way. There's no question about it. On the flip side, 
you know, um, the this university where I work has, um, I thought, I think has done a pretty good job of trying to balance the positive and negative aspects of, of what we're going through, you know. Um, yeah, we had some we had some layoffs, a very unfortunate, very frustrating, in, both in concept and reality that it would come to this. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have found ways to make the best of it. We've gotten uh, some key support in certain areas, not every area, but in certain areas. And that has helped, you know. Um, I feel very fortunate that, um, well, I still have a job. I mean, granted, at, at this point, I have the seniority that, you know, that, that helps me when it comes to those types of decisions. But, you know, with seniority comes expense, you know. The, the older faculty, like me, uh, are more expensive, you know, and because we've worked our way up through the ranks, you know. And so, um, like I said, I feel very fortunate that whatever balancing act um, our university has been able to do, I'm, I, I feel fortunate that, that I'm still employed, that I'm still able to do what I do. And, um, you know, but again, everybody's got a different story, you know, and some folks have definitely suffered because of this. And, uh, but we're finding a way, right? I mean, more people are learning that you really actually can work online or you can work from home and, and still make things work. It may not be the best thing ever, but just like art, <laughs> we're finding a way. Teaching finds a way, you know, and I, and I think we're doing pretty well, all things considered. That doesn't negate the frustrations. Just that's, you know, we're making it work. Yeah. And uh it leads into the next question I had art finds a way teaching art finds a way. How have, how has your daily life looked as a professor, generally speaking in terms of lessons and uh, writing your, just your daily uh, professional schedule, I guess. Okay. Yeah. It was a pre pretty significant change when we moved from, you know, all in person to all online, you know, when, when, you know, we we when the situation was finally serious enough to make that change or people thought it was anyway um that, that was pretty severe um the biggest issue there was we were given basically a week and a half to change everything um, all the assignments all the you know the modalities of, of of teaching and and for many of us myself included it, it was a pretty traumatic change um you know i i Strangely enough, I had enough, I, I have had a, a fair amount of experience, uh, especially early on, in doing things like radio. I was on the, my campus radio station. I worked for a, briefly for a, a, a public radio station uh, when I was living in Michigan. And so, so the idea that you can establish a sort of a pattern with people who are not there <laughs> is kind of interesting, where you talk to people and you're still not sure in some cases who's actually there. Um, so it, it, it makes it a little bit, it, for me, it was a little bit easier than perhaps, you know, other folks who had done, you know, less of that or none of that. Um, but I'd also been dabbling in things like, you know, trying to put together PowerPoints that students could use on their own, uh, you know, with, with like recorded lectures and things like that. But I had done nothing on the scale that was necessary to make that transition. So to answer your question more directly, um, it was pretty traumatic um, to kind of go through that sort of transition. Um, the, and, and as a result, the daily routine was, um, well, it would, it, I guess it was similar. I was gonna say it was pretty different, but it was actually pretty similar because um, lesson wise, because we did lessons um, you know, in real time, there was a schedule, you know, uh, and so that actually was a bit reassuring in a way. Um, and, but classes had to had to go differently, you know. Um, my history class went to you know ninety percent nine yeah about ninety percent online, um, and the ten percent was my choice to have some sort of question and answer and some guided listening uh, things that were synchronous. Uh, but also recorded so that students that, you know, for whatever reason couldn't attend in real time could still, you know, uh, see what went on during that, those particular class periods. 
Um, and that was interesting. Um, well, I think that probably the most interesting thing, I, I, well, I, I, okay, let, let me stick to the scheduling part first. Um, ensembles were pretty much, you know, not a waste, but they were extremely difficult as we dealt with technology imbalance or inequities. Um, that was probably the most revealing thing of all was just when, you know, people had to stay home, um, just how um, unequal uh, Wi-Fi is um, mm. across our state, you know, or even within our county, let alone, you know, across the nation. It was very frustrating um, to have to deal with all of those inconsistencies. And, um, you know, hopefully that's going to be something that we are now aware of as a country and we can take some steps to help that. Um, but anyway, that's another conversation. Um, when we, uh, in the fall, when we went to a sort of hybrid situation, um, I feel very fortunate that we have the facilities to be able to have um, in-person lessons from a distance. You know, we're, we're trying to preserve 12 feet, you know, as far as the normal distance for lessons. Um, <laughs> and try to try to uh, minimize the wandering around and looking over people's shoulders. <laughs> um, but, you know, doing effective masking uh, and that sort of thing. Um, obviously that helped. And uh, from a morale standpoint, not just a schedule standpoint, from a morale standpoint, I thought that was um, very beneficial. And then when we were able to work in small groups in, you know, similar sorts of distance settings, that also, I think, helped. Um, now that's my perspective. You were the student involved. What did you think? I found it, as everyone did to a degree, very difficult when I wasn't, I'm not in school currently, I will be again next quarter, but that first quarter, which was, which would be, uh, this is currently spring. winter quarter. It would be a year ago. Yeah. Spring or no, it would be spring quarter. It was, I mean, it was very hard to have an answer to the question. Why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of faculty felt the same way. Yeah. But, um, it seems like there have been some huge improvements, even adding 10% in-person stuff seems to have made a huge difference with mm -hmm. um, lessons. I mean, for a lot of people, lessons seem to be the only in-person experience, if at all, but even just that seems to be a huge improvement on people's moods and on, um, motivation to keep yeah, going. Isn't, isn't it interesting how dependent we are on personal contact? Even, even it, like, I, there were some folks when we went fully online who actually blossomed because it was like, it's all on me and I just got this and I don't have any other distractions and I can't go anywhere so I can focus and all that sort of thing. Some folks, I, I was totally surprised. Not, not, not that specific individuals, but so many people actually did better because they were sort of forced to take ownership of their progress. Um, and that's true in history as well as lessons. I was very impressed by that, even though, as you say, I mean, we all, to our own personal degrees, had a certain sort of letdown or depression that, that entered into it just because we don't have that same kind of, uh, of personal contact. And, and if nothing else, I mean, what a revelation there. Even though we know these things, you know, it's still, it, it's not until we actually experience it that we, act, we know kind of what, that, what it really means to us. And like I said, that's, that's sort of what I'm hoping for with regard to art and music and so forth in, in the broader sense. But it's going to take a while, you know, no matter yeah. what it is. It's amazing we live in an era where the thought of people gathering in a giant auditorium to watch a huge group of musicians of like 80 people, the thought of that happening now is just so beyond belief. And yet that was happening so recently. Yeah. It's yeah. just amazing how our minds have shifted on that. Yep. And we were, you know, whining about not filling up the concert hall. You know, <laughs> where is yeah, everybody? Right. Come on. <laughs> And now here we are. Yep. Um, Pretty amazing. So you are not 
currently you normally teach music history but you are currently not is that correct yeah um i again another sort of fortunate thing um last year uh, i was nominated for an award and uh, it was very nice university uh, uh, award and um pa and and i got it and part of the award was to have a, a little bit of buyout of my time as a as a uh, a reward, you know, for whatever it is, um, and uh, that was enough to um, relieve me. And and so so the the board of trustees bought out a, a percentage of my time, and uh, so they're paying me as part of this award, and as a result, we're able to take money and move it into having basically a substitute. Um, for the year for my history class and and I miss it. I'm looking forward to uh, teaching it again in the fall um, But by the same token, I'm putting the time that I've been given as a gift uh, To very good use and it a lot of it, you know faculty in general are always looking for more time to work on their personal projects especially if they involve you know scholarship and so forth that is encouraged as part and even required as part of our jobs as teachers at a university, um, we're always looking for that time. And so, I mean, I've had projects brewing for a long time that I just haven't had time to deal with, and this is my opportunity. And and I, I'll never have it again, at least before I retire, uh, whenever that is. Um, I don't expect to, and so I'm just absolutely making the most of it. You know, it's this is no there is no vacation here. On the other hand, it is very replenishing to be sort of allowed to pay attention to my own stuff, the stuff that I'm really passionate about um, in terms of research and stuff like that. So, so it's pretty cool. Uh, but again, very fortunate that um, I was given this opportunity. All right. So I think we, we, we will probably eventually get back to the sorts of things you're doing as they become more relevant. Uh, but I wanted to go back to uh well i wanted to go back to your 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 20s the the Ooh, your youth go like this <laughs> i don't know what that means but <laughs> you know in the, in the movies when you go back in time they, everything gets oh, yeah. so, uh, you know cloudy and you know the, yeah okay yeah right right sure uh, i'll i'll try and remember my 20s it was only so, 40 some years ago yeah i um this is for me what i I'm most looking forward to, to hearing about, even though I've heard a good amount about it, it's all been very jumbled. It's like, oh, this goes here, oh, but this goes way over there, and this goes there. So that that sounds like my twenties. <laughs> that sounds like your office. <laughs> what? Where? What? No. <laughs> yeah. If anyone knows Dr. Snedeker at all, his his office is, uh, you know, you could you could say you could joke and say, oh, it's a reflection of his mind as there's that Albert Einstein quote you have on your door, isn't it? A, if a cluttered desk is the sign of a cluttered mind, what then is, is an empty sign desk. of an empty yeah. desk? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, well, I put that up there on purpose to yeah. sort of, you know, put up the stop sign, the judgmental stop sign. Yeah, when people this are really come into the office and go, <gasps> you know, <laughs> yeah, this, this genius said this about this, about my office. So yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. That would be um, so uh yeah and well i what i was going to say is your office is more a reflection of how m rich your life has been oh, in terms man. of uh <laughs> just things you've done things you've experienced um anyways well let's get to that when you were growing up what role did music play if at all and how did you eventually um get on the french horn train i guess okay. well you know it, it's interesting i've thought about this quite a bit um over the years um you know it's like why did i get into this again um but uh so so i have actually sort of arrived at a set of conclusions for that and and they seem each time i sort of reconsider them they they tend to stay uh pretty consistent in terms of um why i sort of wound up where I am. 
Um, and it, ha it has two parts. Um, and this is true, I think, for everybody. Um, there are the parts where you fail, and then there are the part, and, and you have to, and you still have to do something, right? Uh, the question is what? If you fail at this, you, you wanted to do this and you fail, so now what? Right? So that's one aspect. And then the other part is people tell you that you do things well, you know, and, and, they, and they encourage you and they pat you on the back and you kind of go, oh, I like it when people pat me on the back. I want that to keep going, you know. Um, and so even if you don't necessarily like something, at least at first, um, the fact that people are giving you those positive strokes actually encourages you to keep doing it, right? Um, and so there's, there's, there's those two things. And I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, it, it starts with a pat on the back, and then you have a failure, and then you get a pat on the back, and then you get, you know, I, it would be great if they alternated because then life would be balanced and we could look forward to the next thing, you know. Um, but, you know, again, some people's lives may work that way. Mine didn't. Um, basically, how I got to the horn was, um, I think, I'm still, my, my, my mother says uh, this is not true, but I, I have a funny feeling there was a conspiracy between my uh, mother and my um, elementary band director, which was in El Paso, Texas. That's where, that's where we lived when I was in second grade up through fifth grade. And um, in fifth grade is when we started band uh, at, at this particular school. And um, I went in to, because I, I had, up to that point, I had had some piano lessons uh, because my parents made me do it. And I was singing in a boys choir. Uh, the, the city had a boys choir and somehow I got involved in it. Um, for whatever the reason, I, it wasn't my choice. I mean, I was seven years old, you know, how would I know? Um, but it was, it was very enjoyable. I didn't, I did enjoy the singing part. I never enjoyed the piano, you know, so whatever. Some people just can't or don't. Well, it's a don't, it's a don't, it's not a can't, it's a don't. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and it's a want to versus a have to and all that. So whatever. I found myself. I, I can live, I can live with myself. I can live with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it is a shortcoming on my part. The, um, so I went into the band room and I, I wanted to test out instruments and, and uh, Mr. Kopecky was his name. Uh, and he said, uh, what instrument do you want to play? And I said, uh, trumpet. And he goes, uh, I, I got enough trumpets. Uh, I said, drums, you know? And he says, nah, I got enough drummers. And I didn't know this, I was new, right? Uh, to the whole situation. And this, so up to that point, that's all plausible, right? Because in fact, when I got to the band, there were a lot of trumpets and there were a lot of drummers. But this is where I think the conspiracy actually holds some water. Because I, I said, after he, after he says, no, I got enough drummers, I said, well, I don't know, you know. And he said, how about this instrument here? And it was, it was there. I mean, he had it there. So it was like it was planned <laughs> and it was the French horn. And so I kind of went, okay, what is it? You know? And he said, this is the French horn. And I'm, oh, okay. And, and maybe I knew, this is how I remember it. Who knows? Um, so he showed me how to hold it and he said, okay, so come to band. And what all I want you to do is I want you to go and sit over next to Aurelio, who I knew, Aurelio Soto. I still remember that. And he said, go over and sit next to him and just follow his fingers and, you know, play and go for it. And so I did. Um, the only thing that was weird about that was about two weeks later, my recollection, um, Aurelio disappeared. <laughs> and I'm looking around, where's Aurelio, you know, and, he, and there he is over in the trumpet section playing trumpet. And I'm like, what the heck, you know? So um, that's why I think there was a conspiracy. I have a feeling that my parents really didn't want trumpet sounds and drum sounds dominating a house full of four kids. And it was a really small house. Uh, my parents deny this. I'm not sure I trust them. Yeah, but, but when you, right when you said so one day Aurelio disappeared, that's when the conspiracy thing. That, it was confirmed. <laughs> I, that, it was just confirmed. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, 
I started wondering, well, what's the deal? The reason, though, that I think I stuck with the horn is because there was something special about being the only horn player. You know, you get different attention. Um, I recruited a couple of my friends by the end of that year, so there were three of us. So we were like a little horn club. It was kind of fun. Uh, and then we moved <laughs> to to Buffalo, New York. Um, and it's, it was at that point that um, things definitely changed. Uh, my elementary program it went up to sixth grade um, at the school we went to. And it was okay. Um, it was not as inspiring as the, the one that I started with. But then I got into middle school. And that's where a couple of things st- tried uh, sort of... Uh, started happening. The first is, um, even though I was less special in a bigger band and that sort of thing, I was still the only horn, at least at first. Um, even though I, and I was in the bottom of two bands at the middle school, the other band had five horn players in it. So I knew I wasn't that special, but I was special in that band. And that made me feel good. At the same time, I was really, really hot for sports and in particular baseball. Um, I really wanted to be a baseball player and I didn't have the right stature for it or whatever, but I tried to be scrappy, you know, um, and I tried to be, you know, reasonably balanced in terms of my ability. I, you know, practice my hitting, I practice my fielding and throwing all those sorts of things to try and, you know, sort of make the team. And I did. Um, I didn't make the high school team, but I played, uh, you know, uh, Little League and Babe Ruth um, all the way through my high school years. And uh, when I went to college, um, I tried out for the baseball team there and I I made the first cut of the freshman team. And then I I got down to the final cut and I and I played all through the spring um, but we got down to the final cut and um, it was too much. I, I, whether I would have made it or not, um, I preempted it by saying, you know, my school schedule was too much. I started to uh, sort of feel my oats as far as music goes in that freshman year of college. And um, what happened, I think, and again, looking back on it, was that the sporting aspect, the physical aspects, and the uh, and the technical aspects, uh, and the musical aspects of music and playing the horn in particular, took the place of that sort of sports fantasy. Um, so I view the uh, preparation for making music in the same way that one would prepare uh, as a as an athlete. Um, and, you know, people disagree on that. Uh, most people, I think, agree, though, that there is an art to sports and there is an athletic aspect to music. And so it was easy for me, in some ways, to see the handwriting on the wall as far as baseball goes. Um, and, and like I said, I did play, you know, for a certain amount of time on the freshman team. So I did, I did get that taste, um, but there was no way. I mean, my future was not in that. Um, whether it was at a, at a skill level or at a passion level. And music sort of stepped in and took the place of that. So I became, you know, as much of a horn jock as I could. Now, that sounds really promising, doesn't it? The real problem then surfaced, which was I really didn't like practicing. I like performing. And so that led to some interesting, what, paradoxes, I think it would be the right word, as in, I'll play all day, but what am I practicing, you know, (laughs) and what am I banking on, you know, Um, when I was in high school, I was always uh, sort of anointed the great musician who hadn't practiced technique enough, great sound, great expression, too many missed notes, okay, And I tried to figure out, you know, with help, obviously, how to fix that. But it wasn't an issue of uh, desire as much as it was an issue of maturity and just understanding the true balance of that. And strangely enough, that guy has guided every single pedagogical decision 
that I've made for the sake of my own students. Um, I'm trying desperately to make up for all the mistakes that I made such that you'll make your own mistakes, but I would like you to make fewer of my mistakes than I did. You know, and you'll have to figure it out yourself, um, which is part of learning. Um, but again, whatever I can do to head that off, again, head off the mistakes that I made, have you make those, um, then hopefully I will make the world a better place, <laughs> at least for you. Um, so you asked me about my 20s. We just got to my 20s. Um, well, first, well, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, you went to Heidel, Heidelberg. Heidelberg yes, yeah, now Heidelberg University, whatever that means. Four-year private school uh, in Ohio. Uh, the main reason I went there um, is I got a pretty decent, probably the best financial aid package. And when I visited the campus, it just felt right. It felt like the right place to be. So my instincts said, go there. Um, it was the smallest school that I looked at. Um, but it clearly fit where I was in terms of me personally, what I needed. Um, it also allowed me to do a double major, which uh, in math, which was how I started my college. Um, I, I didn't think I had the discipline for music um, because I knew it, my high school, we had people going to Eastman all the time. My best friend um, is in the Cleveland Orchestra. He's a bassoonist. And uh, still to this day, we're in, you know, relatively close touch. Um, but my best friend in high school, he went to Eastman and he's been on the orchestra path ever since, you know. And when I committed to music, I thought that was the only way um, because that's how the jocks behaved, you know. Um, that's That was the proof. And I still have a distraction with that, even though I don't necessarily believe that anymore, that that's the, that's the pinnacle. It's certainly the pinnacle of certain kinds of music and certain kinds of playing, but it doesn't have to be the pinnacle for everything. Um, there are lots of other types of music and there are lots of other ways um, to be artistic. And so, you know, that's what's up. Yeah, but you, you, you can also hold your own with those jocks also because you were the first place winner at some point for an international natural horn competition. Is oh, that yeah. right? Yeah. And that, that happened, you know, when, when I was here, actually, in, in my first year I was here. So I was about 31, 32, something like that, um, when that happened. And um, the, the natural horn is, you know, it's a, it's a long, curvy path. Um, in, in trying to summarize it, it it's an it's an interesting thing um, for for me because it started out as um, sort of like well let's try this for a while this looks like fun you know I was I didn't take it seriously but then when I got into it it was like oh I could take this seriously and not only do I like it but I'm kind of good at it you know um, and so let's see what happens but. It, there's more to it than that. I mean, there's a whole pathway that involves things like cornets, cornettos and sackbutts and recorders and Shakespeare festivals. And I mean, and it all kind of starts in the Renaissance and, and the medieval period and it sort of winds its way toward the horn. In some ways, from a historical performance standpoint, the natural horn was the last thing I came to, not the first thing. Even though... I had some very interesting sort of formative uh, experiences with natural horn early on. That's still, I was making money through my 20s playing Renaissance music, you know, and playing in a Shakespeare festival, being music director there. Um, and so th there was a lot of that, you know, um, and, and a lot of me in funny costumes. Yeah, uh, if anybody wants to... Um... I won't show it here. You can look up. I mean, first of all, if you don't know the instruments we're talking about, you know, Google's a pretty amazing thing. Um, but you should look up on YouTube. I think you can, if you look up something like Jeffrey Snedeker, Gabrielli, or something, Ooh. you can find a video. Wow. And the thumbnail for it is, uh, well, I won't ruin the surprise, but it involves 
Dr. Snedeker wearing the sort of outfit you would see at a Renaissance festival, which, um, you know, yeah. I, I think it's something to be proud of. I think it's really, <laughs> and I still but it's have, amusing. I don't, have that, I don't have that costume, but I still have one that still fits that I could, you know, if I had to, but it would have to, I mean, have to, I'd have to be paid big time to put that mm -hmm. on again. Yeah. That, and that, I, that's just great. You're makes that was you... my go-to Halloween costume for years. <laughs> <laughs> so I went real quick. I wanted to go back to the the math. You got a math major, also, right? Right. And I I went to school as a math major. It seemed like a practical thing, but it, when you think about that, it's like, wait. So math, pure math, is more practical than music. You know, all those freelance mathematicians out there. You know, <laughs> um, but it, but my parents were really good about um, encouraging what to study in college they they were very encouraging to just you know follow your passion uh, and the stuff that you like to do and and the job situation will work itself out you know you're, you won't necessarily get you know everything you want right off the bat which was definitely true still working on those actually mm -hmm. um, but the idea of you know if you follow your passion in a way you're you become more willing to put up with the crap that comes with every job, right? Every job has its good things and its bad things. It's just a question of percentages, you know? And if you follow something that you're passionate about and you can see how your passion fits the job, then you're much more willing, I think, to put up with the stuff that you don't want to do, but you still have to do to keep the job. And, you know, it. so it becomes a really worthwhile trade-off because you still get to do the stuff that you like even if you don't like all the things about it, you know? So like in my job, I, 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 I'm actually kind of good at paperwork, um, but that doesn't mean I like it, you know? I like the teaching, I like the playing, um, I like the, the, the requirement for doing research, right? The, the, that pro, you know, promotes that. I like so, the value that is placed on serving the community, um, particularly the professional field. And so, you know, like I, I, I say it a lot. I like probably 70% of my job and I feel extremely fortunate that I do. So, but every job is like that. It's just a question yeah. of how much. And I'm, I'm lucky that way, I think. So when... when well, okay. Come... So, so, the, so the math thing went on for a couple of years in, uh, as being a sort of primary thing. It, and it sort of shifted. It started out, math was the primary focus, and I would figure out what I was going to do later. Um, music became sort of like, okay, I guess I can do this after all, so that's fun. Um, and, and gradually what happened was the percentages kind of shifted where this the music got bigger and more prominent, and the math gradually sort of receded. By the time I got to the end of my junior year, I was pretty much committed to music um as, as far as the next step goes so um it was just a question of will i finish the math major and it just seemed kind of stupid to you know to just leave it hanging so i only had a one or two classes left so i finished that um it's good that i did though because one of the jobs that i had after that when i when i continued with graduate school was i didn't get a music teaching assistantship i i and so i had nothing to support myself within the school um, but I went over to the math department. This was at Ohio State, you know, this massive university. Um, I went over to the math department. I says, hi, I have a math major, and I heard that you um, will hire people to do overflow sections um, for, you know, uh, you know, beginning math classes. And they said, yes, we do. Sign here and come back on the first day of classes, and we'll let you know if you have a job. <laughs> And I did. I got one. Um, so I was able to pay for that year of schooling based on a math TA. So completing that major actually benefited me, even though I had no intention of ever using it again. Hmm. Um, the skills I learned in terms of being detail oriented and so forth, it's the same as music. You know, you just have to kind of figure out balance, you know, equations and get things to come out right. It's the same process when you're practicing. So fit me just fine so the first was 
uh, you went from high Heidelberg to Ohio State, or was it to no, Michigan? No, actually, I went to University of Michigan first, um, and that was an interesting uh, process because um, I I had studied at, at Heidelberg. I had three horn teachers in four years. Every single one of them was a graduate of the University of Michigan, and so as I looked ahead, each you know all three of them were like, "You should go study with Louis Stout at Michigan," and I was like, "Okay," so I. Fortunately, my parents moved from Buffalo, well, I don't know if it's fortunate, but they did move from Buffalo to um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So as it turned out, I had to drive through Ann Arbor anyway on my way home for breaks and things like that. So again, somewhere in my junior year, I contacted Louis Stout and I said, hi, I study with your son, Louis Jr., <laughs> which I did. Um, can I have a lesson with you? I'm thinking about graduate school in a couple of years. And he's like, sure. You know, it cost you 7,000. No, it didn't cost me that. But, but he said, here's how much it costs. You know, when can you come? And so we, we made it work and it was great. You know, it was definitely the next level of expectation and intensity. Uh, and he was really nice about it. Um, in terms of, you know, I was still studying with his son and then other students of his. Um, so it was all very supportive and, uh, so it was an easy choice for the next step, which would be Michigan. Uh, the only thing that was a kind of a drawback was financially, I got no support from the university at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I had some work study and some loans and that was it. No TA, no nothing. Um, but I went anyway, uh, because my parents lived in Michigan now, I was, um, in state tuition. So that helped. Um, but. I also decided to ramp up the um, the time to degree because I, that was all I could afford. And so I did it all in one year, uh, which was, I wish I had not done that uh, in <laughs> that retrospect. That's what I'm but, but, well, it is and it isn't because think of it this way. I had 10 hours of work study a week, which paid some things. The rest of it was loans. So even though I didn't like the idea of loans, I didn't have anything else to do except practice and study. And so I did. <laughs> and so as a result, I finished, you know, but it was pretty intense. My recital was really intense because, you know, I, I went through an embouchure change and I went, you know, and it was sort of like, oh my goodness, how, how is this going to happen? And I survived, you know, uh, and it was the best thing for me in the sense that it showed me what I could do when the pressure's on. And, and I, it wasn't the greatest recital ever, but I made it through and it was respectable and it allowed me to go on to the next thing. And that, then it was Ohio state for music history. And Bef uh, before I forget, yeah. uh, you, one of your first teachers was, uh, a familiar name to horn players because he wrote, uh, well, non horn players might not know about this, but I don't even know who's listening, but. If you're a horn player and you're listening, you know probably about the fripperies and the the bipperies and all those fun ipperies. And you, one of your first teachers was Lowell Shaw, who That's right. wrote all these things. That's right. He was uh, very patient with me because I was still grappling, as any high schooler is, with you know what do I want to do with myself, and and why do I have to practice? Those are the two questions, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, he, he was really supportive um, in that he could see, he says, well, he was, at, he was happy to take my money, first of all. Um, <laughs> but uh, he could see that I was passionate about it. I just needed to sort out how it was going to fit, you know. And um, I went to a couple of the Buffalo Horn Club um, uh, reading sessions, you know, where we played all these incredible things. And, there were, you know, members of the Buffalo Philharmonic were there, college students you know, amateurs in the community. And the enthusiasm was just overwhelming. The playing was also overwhelming in the, in the, in the intimidation direction, but the, but the feeling of being there, you know, and honestly, I was intimidated enough and I had other interests, you know, the sports thing and all that, that I didn't go very often. You know, I'm not going to pretend that I was, you know, magically drawn into the, the Lowell Shaw orbit. Um, he was my teacher. He showed me how to be, you know, how to try and at least try to balance 
the passion and the practicing and all that sort of thing. And he was very patient with me. And I studied with him for six years. Um, and uh, I, I always tease him about, you know, I managed to get three good years of lessons into six. <laughs> which if you think about it, it's sort of backwards. Um, but uh, I had such trouble practicing. I was so distracted by sports and, and that sort of thing um, and trying to figure out if I could even do sports. I was no star, you know. I just was passionate about doing, doing. That was the thing. Um, and, and even then, there wasn't a lot of money in sports anyway, you know, so uh, not like it is now. Um, so anyway, yeah, Shaw was great. It, what a wonderful influence in terms of attitude. When I came back, you know, uh, and, and after after being away from him for a while, and went back and, and sort of ran into him, um, he was surprised I still played the horn. <laughs> Just like, what are, what are you doing? You know, what are, what are you doing with the horn? You know, <laughs> I like it. You know, and ever since then, he's been very proud to call me <laughs> his former student. Um, but he was stunned that I continued at all. So whatever, that's how it goes. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, when, when the, he was at the, we were at the uh, an international horn symposium in Indiana. He was there and I it wasn't, it was pretty crazy to think about like all these pieces that are so beloved by so many horn players. Oh, there's this, he's just here. Yeah, this there he is, he's friend. a guy. Yeah. And he's so funny too, cause it's like, you say something like, you know, I really, the fripperies are great. And he's like, oh, thanks, you know, it's, you know, it's just fun. We just tried to have some fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, what? what? <laughs> these are great, these are hallowed ground, you know, for horn players. It sounds like that. that's maybe how J.S. Bach would talk yeah. about a bunch of his music too. Absolutely. Just a regular guy <laughs> writing music that's fun to play. That was, yeah. the thing, you know, so, it's sort of lucky that people liked it. Mm. So, uh, people are, are people elevate to him to a, to a deity status at this point. And rightly so. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I wanted to get back to your the transition from the undergraduate to graduate studies and what sure. that was like. So you did. You went straight from your undergraduate to Michigan, right? Right, for performance. Um, and my bachelor's degree was a bachelor of arts degree, not a, not a bachelor of music degree, um, because that allowed me to have um, two majors in separate departments and still finish in four years. So, and, and that worked out great for me because, um, you know, anybody who knows me knows that I like so many things. It's just a very broad selection of interests that depth becomes kind of troubling, you know, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Um, cause I also like depth and that's, that's where I get into trouble trying to figure out how to keep all the balls in the air, so to speak. Um, uh, so to go into performance uh, and especially to go from a small school to a big school was really traumatic. Um, very difficult, uh, very, a lot of, uh, performance anxiety. I could barely play for a while. Because I was just so afraid of making mistakes. Um, I think, you know, to answer your question directly, the biggest challenge, I think, when moving from undergraduate to graduate is you forget that when you came in as an undergraduate that you started at the bottom of the food chain and you just kind of worked your way up. And the feeling is that, or the expectation is that when you move into graduate school, then you're just going to keep right on going. Right, that you're you got to the top of the heap, and now you're you're a graduate student, so you're just going to keep right on at the top of the heap and keep you know going. And what often happens is when you move into a new food chain, <laughs> it's different, and especially if it's more competitive, you tend to you, you may not go all the way to the bottom, you know, and and be like, I'm a master's student, but I'm competing with freshmen. But you know it could happen because at a better place, those freshmen sometimes are better than the freshmen that you were four years ago. So, so the idea is that we, we have to try and temper the expectation 
in terms of where you're going to fit in and to actually be prepared to be not at the sort of top of the heap and continue growing. Um, to realize that with every new situation comes a new set of challenges, right? And some folks are already into that level, right? And what we learn from that is not that we should be, just be humble all the time, which is actually a good thing. Um, what we learn from that is there's always somebody who's better than you, who's younger than you. Always, right? And especially now that I'm this age, there's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Back when I was younger, there weren't so many. <laughs> but it was just because, you know, there weren't that many. Um, but now it, it, it's, it's a constant sort of um, adjustment, you know, between our egos and our value systems and understanding that, this is how human beings are, right? So it took me a while to figure that out. Um, uh, the fact that I knew the teacher longer than just arriving and then you know, I, I knew him for two years before that, taking lessons every once in a while. So I was somewhat prepared for that, but it was still pretty rude when I walked into my first you know, band rehearsal and I'm warming up and I'm listening to these other people who I had met and I knew what age they were. They were all younger than me. And I'm going, I'm sitting ahead of those people. Man, they are great. <laughs> and so immediately you, you sort of go on the defensive. And of course, we would like to be prepared for that so we don't have to go through that. But inevitably it's going to happen. It happens in every job. You know, when you come to... Uh, like like when I came to this university position, you know, it was like, oh, okay, I'm ready to be one of the one of the team, you know. And it's like, no, you start at a, the bottom of a new food chain, and you have to fig ha figure out how to navigate your way. And all those things you thought you knew are certainly valid; they're important, but there's a new context now. And figuring out how to navigate that, adjust what needs to be adjusted, and look for your opportunities to use those expertise without getting carried away with uh, f sort of false expectations, is th it's always part of the adjustment period. And so if we're ready for that, you know, it's like, it's like the bucket of cold water is out there. Um, it's just a matter of the more you prepare, the smaller that bucket gets, right? But it's still going to hit you. It's still going to dump on you. If you're not prepared or you ignore it or you deny it, that bucket gets pretty big and pretty cold. And it's coming, right? It's just a question of are you, have you prepared yourself so that it's only this big or is it really just going to be, you know, the avalanche or the, the flood, you know? And whatever it is, okay, that happens. Now what? What happens next? So... Um, so to try and nutshell the, the, the 20s, um, there's a lot of that. <laughs> um, I, I, I did, you know, the graduate stuff uh, in performance, then in music history, which required a whole new sort of mindset that I was totally unprepared for. I thought the passion would carry me through it. You got to like the discipline involved in doing research is just as intense and necessary as learning how to practice. And I wasn't sure I knew how to do either one of those things very well, at least at that stage. So you learn. You, now what? Fail. Now what? Oh, that's okay? Good. I'll keep doing that. Fail. Now what? Oh, this is okay? Keep doing that. You know, um, I, I finished that degree. Uh, it took me a little longer than planned, uh, but it was only because I just needed the time to like figure out how to do it. Um, I was out for about three years. Uh, working mostly part-time uh, adjunct positions. Uh, I had managed to sort of cobble together a couple of uh, part-time positions at, at a couple of colleges. Um, most of them involved a pretty healthy amount of driving, but what that's what happens. Um, and things were going okay with those, um, but I was looking for ways to sort of consolidate, maybe get a full-time position. Um, I did take some orchestra auditions, failed miserably at them. 
Um, but I tried, you know. Um, not sure what I learned other than <laughs> I can't audition. I didn't audition well. Um, so uh, so the, the, the question then becomes, well, all right, how do you get farther along? You know, how do you consolidate? And um, my uh, sort of, it wasn't really a revelation. It was more of a discovery is that if I, the job I wanted required one of two things, either 10 years in a symphony, which wasn't happening, a full-time symphony, to, and that's to get the credential such that someone will hire you to teach lessons, right? Or I needed a doctorate. And it's not that those are equivalent, but in the eyes of some universities, and depending on what type of university you want to work at, they have, you know, different values. So at the place that's more conservatory-like or the, the bigger school that wants a specialist, that 10 years in the orchestra was important, you know. Um, for a more comprehensive university where the teaching position might be combined, then the doctorate worked in some ways better um, as long as you had the other sort of performance credentials to back it up. Um, and what I had done pr very purposely was you know, keep working on the performance aspect of it, do a lot of freelancing, do a lot of, uh, you know, whatever I could manage. Um, in the, at the same time, working on the music history degree to create a legitimate credential to teach the, uh, a classroom subject. Um, and it worked in the end, um, once, once I went back for the doctorate. Uh, and that was sort of the clincher uh, in giving me those credentials. Because, and if, if you think about it very carefully, um, when I said 10 years in an orchestra, okay, let's pretend that I was qualified enough to get that position right out of college. I wasn't, or right out of the master's a year later. Okay, so that means that 10 years from then would have been, let's say, let's say 1981 would have been 1991. 10 years, let's say I got that orchestra job. 10 years later would have been 1991, okay? If you, if, I, if you look at the other route, which is accomplishing the doctorate, okay? I came to Central on a six-month contract in 1991. So the 10-year issue, whether it's the orchestra or the cobbling together of other credentials, performance and research, teaching, whatever, right? All of those things. It still worked out to be 10 years, <laughs> you know, from the end of my bachelor's degree. So, you know, my path wasn't get one job, then finish that job and get the next job and get the, you know, it was like, okay, what am I going to do? Let's, let's get that job and that job and that job and that job and let's put those and then let's keep those and then let's throw off this one and add this one. And, you know, so it was just a bunch of stuff. And, and by the way, um, through all of that, at least for the first five years of those 10, there were non-music jobs. I worked at Kmart. I was good at Kmart, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that, that tends to get lost in the shuffle because what we want to believe is we get a bachelor's degree and off we go. And the answer is, you're right, off we go. <laughs> it's just not necessarily this, you know, sort of, it, at least anymore, it's not this concrete path that you do this, which leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to that. It's definitely something that's, well, you can try for that, but if that doesn't happen, you might wind up over here. And then, you you know, and gradually you work your way over to it. So in the end, it took me 10 years to get a full-time uh, um, university job. And whether it was the 10 years in the orchestra or the 10 years by the meandering path of excitement, um, you know, it was still 10 years. Yeah, it seems like when you're in your 20s, you're, at least I'm always trying to juggle around between oh, what's the right decision to make. But what I've been realizing talking to people like you or hearing other people talk about this sort of stuff, you eventually just have to make a bad decision 
and live with it and then figure it out, right? Yeah, I mean, just, just make any decision. Interestingly enough, this is, it's, this is a, a, a gross overstatement, right? But the key here is just say yes. Say yes. Do it. Fig see what happens. And if you fail, okay, now you know that that was not a bad choice. But you actually don't know whether it's a bad choice until you actually do it, right? So if you can keep some sense of humility and realize that failure is an important element of succeeding, then every, every success or failure gives you information that you can use, right? In, in, including that information of, man, I'm never going to do that again. You know, that's actually useful information. Right. Even even if you do it again and you go, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I thought I wasn't going to do that again. <laughs> well, now I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought I wasn't going to have this kind of part time job again. But here I am. But here I am. And, like and, and the important thing there is like, OK. What's going to happen next? What do you want to have happen next? You know, and what can you do to keep the job you have so you don't screw that up? But at the same time, keep looking forward right? Keep saying yes to things. Um, and in those early years, you, basically, I just said yes to any job, anytime, anywhere, so that I could support myself. And then after a while, I, knowing, I knew this, because I, w I learned it, that once I, once I felt confident that I could support myself, then that gave me the confidence to start looking to be more picky about things. And this isn't the right way for everybody. It just turned out to be the right way for me, right? But I do think the attitude, not, not necessarily, I don't, I'm not telling everybody, you know, okay, so when you're 24 years old, you need a job at Kmart, full-time job at Kmart, plus um, a job uh, as a custodian in a, um, a uh, uh, office building and work as a doorman at a movie theater and try to teach a couple of private lessons on the side badly um, and you know it, it, do all those things I'm not saying that what I'm saying is if you have an attitude of saying can I say yes and and do this okay what what am I don't worry about what you're going to get out of it other than I need to keep paying my bills you know because <laughs> I don't want to go live home again you know I love my family I love my brothers but I want to I don't want to be there I want to prove to myself that I can do this. And then once I get that sort of foundation and that kind of like, okay, I know now I have what it takes to support myself. Now, what would I rather be doing? That's a different decision than can I actually do this? And it, it leads to more yeses. Can I work at a place that will allow me to freelance, right? Um, or do I need to change jobs because now I'm getting enough freelancing that I need that? So do I need to leave this job? Can I, you know, can I find another job that'll, and, and so it becomes a very busy, ongoing sort of thing, but okay. <laughs> my, otherwise my choice is sit home and complain, <laughs> you know? Yeah, now, right, right about now, it seems like. That's the probably the case with a lot of people. That's okay. That, sometimes <laughs> we have to do that to get sick of whatever it is that we're complaining about mm, to then yeah. do something, right? I, I firmly believe, <laughs> this is going to sound funny coming uh, from, you know, having had lessons with me for a while. Um, I firmly believe that change doesn't take place until someone is so sick of their situation that they, they feel they have to change or that's it, you know? And, and believe it or not, that's actually the um, uh, conscious approach I use to embouchure changes. Hmm. I have to challenge, this is what Louis Stout did with me, and it worked. I have to challenge you in ways that make it necessary for you, for you to want to change. And I'm not going to do it gratuitously. It's sort of like, okay, you want to be a player? You have to play this. You have to play in this range. You have to be able to trill like this. You have to be able to do this, you know. Da, 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 da. You, it's on the audition. I mean, not even like to get the gig. 
you have to do that just to get the gig. You're not going to grow into it. That was my, my, by the way, that was my biggest problem with auditions is I kept banking on the idea that, well, I've done everything I can. Um, maybe they'll let me grow into the job. <laughs> How's my potential? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, potential is great, except it means nothing. You know, it's why would they hire somebody on potential if they can hire somebody who can actually do the job? And that's the case. So that's we, that's tough because you want your your degree to mean something. But if you decide it only means something, if I get a job only in my field that I specialized in or else I'm a failure, uh, that's that's like sort of opposite world from <laughs> like in the business world. You know, you get a degree in finance. You're not just going to go work for a finance company. You're going to you can work in many different companies and be an incredible success. So why worry about that? Worry about stuff that you can actually control. So anyway. sounds like for you the your 20s uh it seems to be well I'm I'm still in my early 20s. So I'm and I just have received an undergraduate degree so I am now I've now encountered the vast abyss of potential or chaos, whatever you want to call it, but it, it surely is an abyss of something. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. It's, you can, it's you, fun. You can swim in there. You can parachute in there. I mean, you, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. It. You can just float and just kind of go. Oh, I'm gonna do that for a while. You know, I'm do that. This is the. the yeah. I mean, in a way, this is the time. You know, it's tough because. I think part of the difficulty that people have is when you spend a lot on your education, you really want to feel like you're going to get something for it, you know, and your parents make you feel that way, right? Or you feel that way or doesn't matter. You just, you just kind of go, well, what was that all about? You know? Um, and it's hard. It's hard when things are so expensive nowadays um, that it's, it's hard to accept the fact that things may be different. Right. Or it may not go the way you think, but that doesn't mean you didn't learn anything. Right. It, in some ways, that's the test of your education is what are you going to do now? What can you do now? You know, and it's not about proving yourself in that specialization. It's like, how do you become um, a, a, a sort of productive member of society? You know, the. The, the, the productive member of society is not evaluated based on whether they are in a career that matches their bachelor's degree. It's what you do with what you learned. And that doesn't mean you're a failure if you don't, get a, you don't win an orchestra job. There are lots of people who are not failures, who have performance degrees and are not even playing the instrument. They are amazing successes. And that's it's it's gotta be okay. Yeah, there there's just in the music undergraduate, I feel like there there if I learned anything from it, a huge amount of what I learned was just from interacting with people. Yeah. Not even in class situations. Although there are so many skills we learned, like how to do Chicago style uh, citation and all that, all that stuff, uh, becoming a better writer, more concise writer, mm -hmm. um, being able to give presentations, yeah. uh, which is just teaching yeah. uh, and all this stuff. But I learned so much just from my interactions with other people. Yeah. And I learned more from that than I would have expected. Yeah. I um, think that's so great. Th that's just a sign of how like you'll learn things from aspects of your life that you may not expect to learn from. And, and if you're open, yeah. And if you're open to that possibility, there's so much more that you get and you start what's What I've always found interesting is that the more open I am or, or try to be, the more I discover value in things that I didn't know had value, right? Whether it's to me personally or to, you know, the people I'm interacting with or, you know, society in general or whatever you know you, you try and do what you try and do the best you can but i think what's hard sometimes is 
we 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 literally try to control things so much so that we we sort of stunt our own growth and i think if we can just kind of trust let things go trust who you are as a person not necessarily this skill or that skill or whatever class you had but just like take a step back and kind of go okay how do i want to be treated how can i treat other people what can i do to help a situation right um and and that's very that that's much easier to have that conversation within yourself when you have a job <laughs> that's paying you enough to live on right so i mean there there are distractions there but you know you can take the same approach to yourself you can say all right well what do i really need you know granted i don't want to work at kmart my whole life but i got to eat and i got to pay rent and if i want to live by myself this is what I'm going to have to do. So why get bummed out about the job I have when in fact having that job allows me to take a step in the direction that I want to go? So no reason to get, you know, you can still hate the job <laughs> and, and you can't wait for the next one. But, you know, you can still have a good attitude about it while you're there, you know? And actually, you know, I it's so funny, the... the uh, the best compliment I ever got at Kmart was also the most horrific uh, it, it, because they said, have you ever thought about joining our management training program? <laughs> I'm like, uh, thank you. <laughs> run away, run away. <laughs> but it was a nice, I mean, it was very nice of them, you know, to think that much of me, you know, and then I thought, oh, I've, I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> I've been way too competent, you know. <laughs> That's really but, funny. Of a... Whatever. Yeah. My life could have been very different. <laughs> yeah, but instead you got your, you did your doctoral studies and you uh, eventually you got hired at this little known university in, in the middle of Washington state in farm country. Little did I know how well known it was uh, when mm. I, you know, because it, you know, it's it's a pretty great place, especially for for music education. We we have our ups. Every school has its ups and downs, you know. But you know, I I've always been very pleased with the you know every even when we get a little bit sidetracked on things, you know, we kind of go, Clock, you know, oh wait, we're supposed to be doing this, you know, and mm -hmm. and we get we get ourselves back on track. You know? So, but it's it's been a great place to work, no question mm -hmm. about it. So I. Since we're, I guess this will be the episode about t people in their 20s, just because at this time, it's what I'm most interested in, because it sure. seems so, um, like, it's just a huge landscape of potential yeah. that yeah. we're encountered with. And it's very overwhelming to choose the hill to climb, because there are so many, or the mountain, whatever. And then you fall down the pit, and then you kind of climb back out. So many. What are some? Uh, what are some differences, if any, that you notice about people in their twenties nowadays versus people in their twenties when you were in your twenties? If it's even yeah. possible to describe, yeah, it, it's pretty tough um, for me to make that comparison because, you know, it, my perception of 20 year 20 year olds as a as a person in their 60s <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, is is really interesting you know um, I think that 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 20 year olds today have way more uh, options um, uh, than existed in the past and it's i think it's it's it, just my opinion um i think it's based totally on the expansion of technology and media um so as a result there are more ways to play with you know video and audio and stuff like that for everybody as opposed to you know when, when i was in my 20s i had a, a moment where i thought about doing maybe recording you know try, get, learning how to work a recording studio and it was partly because I had a little bit of public radio experience, and I thought, "Well, this is kind of fun. I like this sort, you know, sort of stuff." But it turned out what I really liked was being on the air and talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it didn't have anything to do with the technology. Um, 
but I didn't know that till after. Um, as I pursued it, what what I learned was you had to kind of go through apprenticeship programs, and you could, you know, if you saved up a bunch of money, you could pay to go to a, a, a particular, like a recording studio institute, where you could learn about that stuff. And those still exist. But now there's so much more that's available just online um, uh, and just through other media sources that you can learn a lot without having to go through that. The hard part is figuring out how to get paid for it. And um, today's 20-year-olds have to be much more entrepreneurial because, thanks to media, everybody's in the game, you know, and, and in the like in the forefront of the game. Whereas in the past, you had to go somewhere to kind of get the credential, and then you could sort of move your way into the business. But now you can just like be in the business immediately. And, and really, uh, I mean, that's a good thing and a bad thing because it's a good thing because you're going to get way more experience, but it's a bad thing in that there's a certain advantage to kind of working your way up the food chain. There's a maturity and a realism that enters into it um, in terms of expectations and developing skills and that sort of thing. It, people used to call it paying your dues. I don't really think of it as paying dues per se, but there is a, some value in kind of the step-by-step -step process of learning this and kind of going and, and giving yourself a sense. Maturity allows you to kind of go, okay, here's how I can use this, you know, for good instead of evil, you know. When you're thrust into it and you don't have that sort of experience to temper what you're learning, things can get out of whack really fast, um, especially in terms of expectations. And that's where people start burning out or taking on <laughs> evil thing, you know, I mean, just, it can, it can turn into something really bizarre and it can shake people up pretty severely. So, but that's my perception, you know, um, I think a lot of folks might see all of that as a positive, you know, it's like, okay, you want to be in the deep end, you can get, you can jump in anytime, you know, um, and you will have to learn how to swim. So good luck, you know, um, so, but I think there are advantages to that. Um, the disadvantages of the past that I described were you really did get stuck sometimes having to pay your dues over and over and over, um, whereas now, not so much. Um, but you are, I think, with, with less maturity comes more vulnerability, and I think that is a problem, right, um, that, that it, or a difference that needs to be accounted for somehow. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. That understanding right there is why when we talk in lessons about learning how to uh, develop a tool belt right of all these devices and you may use some of them a lot and some of them less but knowing what they are gives you the opportunity to then use them once you're done not you know you don't master all of them all at once it'd be great but the apprenticeship program of a, uh, in, like if you're working in, in manual labor or something like that, has a certain value because they it's like you now have enough experience to use this hammer, right? You can't use this drill yet. You have to wait and you have to do some training and then we'll let you use it because so much is at stake when you use that drill on behalf of our business, right? And so... The, those apprenticeship uh, concepts or the training concepts like that definitely have value, even though they have their downside. And that was the past. Now, we seem to be able to bypass that stuff. And I'm not convinced it's always the best idea. It, it's convenient, right? And it does expose you to more real life sooner. But again, it's all, it all depends on what else you've learned um, in the process, such that for, hopefully you have and the right sort of level of maturity to make yourself less vulnerable in these situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what you were saying about the toolbox or tool belt is where you, where you have a huge, a wide selection of tools, but you don't, you're not necessarily perfect at using all of them. You just have the basic, very bare minimum knowledge of each tool. seems like that's a very important thing nowadays. I, I not think, that it, not that it wasn't before, but um, there's just 
there's a lot of people now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. No, and, and I think it is. I think in, in some ways that's the healthiest perspective you can have when you leave college is to have enough sort of understanding that now you can actually start using them by your own choice, right? And saying yes allows you to kind of go, oh, if I do this gig, I can, I, I, I get to use this tool, you know? And so, but, but it's a, it's a process and it needs to be a process because that's where, in a sense, that's where the maturity we need to balance all those ups and downs and those challenges come from. It's like anything else, you know, it can seem very mysterious as to how to support yourself. Um, but I, I kept, <laughs> I remember that feeling and, and, and thinking to myself, yeah, but wait a minute. So-and-so I know, they've been supporting themselves for 10 years. How did they do that? If they can do that, I can definitely do that. You know, <laughs> right, right or wrong, I took heart in that. I actually, uh, I, I, I'll give you this one little personal tidbit. Um, I was uh, dating a person uh, back in graduate school, and uh, this person had musical experiences, um, but was definitely oriented toward a, in a different direction entirely. And at one point, as we were talking about our future together, um, uh, this person asked me, you know, well, you say that you're interested in teaching at the university level, and I was still years from that. You know, how much money do you think you're going to make at that? And I thought to myself, why does the amount matter? I know people that are making a living at it, that's good enough for me, you know, at least at this stage. Well, they had a different set of values. I'm not criticizing at all. They just, they had other plans and they were farther along in their own process in terms of deciding what they wanted out of their lives. And as a result, you know, we didn't connect very well and it, so the relationship ended. Um, and that's fine. I mean, it, you know, you, you, you decide what you decide. But it was interesting to me that, um, in retrospect, that those, the, the, those details were not important to me at that time because there are plenty of examples of people around me that were doing just fine, and I didn't need to know the details yet because I didn't have that level of commitment uh, necessary in my personal life to warrant having to make those decisions. You know, I wasn't there yet. And whether that's maturity or not, I don't know. We were just at different points along the path for that it, in, in terms of deciding whether that relationship could con continue. And it didn't. And in the end, that was good. I, I'm assuming she's very happy, you know, because I'm, I'm assuming she found what she needed. I don't know. Uh, I certainly, in, the, in retrospect, I'm very glad it didn't work out. Not Nothing personal toward her at all. But just in terms of the way my life has transpired, I couldn't be happier. You know, so there you go. Well, I could yeah. be happier. I, I could, I could, <laughs> I could have a little higher salary. That'd be all right. But, you know, but whatever. Yeah, you. Um, well, whatever path you're on, you you get to work with all of us amazing undergraduates. So I know, <laughs> and you are amazing in so yeah, many. We're ways. Amazing and annoying, and <laughs> don't practice, and you know, don't do the stuff you tell us to do. And you, you somehow, uh, you somehow maintain a degree of patience, at least in my experience. I don't know how, how others well, experience the lessons, but it, 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 it depends on your view of education, right? Yeah. If you look at education in a very sort of pure sense, what you hope is I've learned this. Now I can do this. I've learned this. Now I can do this and so on. And what I've learned about myself <laughs> It doesn't go like that, you know. I mean, sometimes I learn something; and it takes you know five years before I actually use it, you know. But then I'm glad I had it, and then I wonder why I didn't use it. Be you know, it's 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 not as haphazard or chaotic as it sounds. But it there is an element of sort of entropy involved here in in education that you just kind of hope, right? Instead of worrying about this, you kind of go like this, and you just kind of go, okay, wait, 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 wait. And, and I think that's necessary because if we do too much of this as teachers, um, we're in a way we're trying to turn people out that are sort of like us. 
and that's too bad you know even the, even the best i i mean i hope people imitate the aspects of me that they like the best and that apply to them directly but do i expect that i hope not <laughs> the idea of a bunch of little me's running around is really frightening you know um well it's I very mean, funny to imagine though uh, well i hope not um <laughs> It does. It does like bring up, you know, the like the um, uh, images of movies like Minions, and you know, it's just like oh, yeah, shit. that precisely. <laughs> oh, that's really kind of squir squirrely, but um, but if you believe that education is something that each person acquires, you know, on their own terms and then uses on their own terms, then that infers a mutual responsibility, right? The mutual responsibility is. I want you to do as much as you can. And I want to help you with that. But ultimately, the decisions are yours. You know, and I can guide you. I can say things like, eh, maybe let's not think about nuclear science. You know, let's not do that. Um, but but I don't know that. Right. Um, all I can do is sort of help. And the other part of this is um, there are always exceptions. There are people that I will never say who have graduated from here. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> sort of like Lowell Shaw was with me. It's like, are you still playing the horn? Really? You know? Um, and yet amazing. They do amazing things and it's cool. I like it. I take no credit for it <laughs> unless they give it to me. And then that's fine. I don't know, whatever. But that's, that's their choice. Not my choice. Fascinating. Teaching is really fascinating. You, you have to figure out the right balance for your, your own ego. Um, and remember that, that your ego is for you, but not for them. They have to do their own thing, and you have to be okay with that. And hopefully they learn, and when they don't, you, you try not to go, <laughs> told you, you know, uh, try not to do that too blatantly but it's okay. And when anybody comes back to me and, and, you know, and, and says, you were right. I was so wrong. I'm so sorry. It's like, no, come on. We, we figure these things out whenever, you know, I, you, you may, maybe you remember this saying of mine, I learn something old every day, you know, mm -hmm. which is something that I thought I knew and thought I had figured out. Apparently I didn't because I did it again. You know, um, and oh, well, there we go. So why can't anybody else be like that? Other people have to figure stuff out on their own. All I can do is help. Yeah, the, it's so interesting to hear you talk about teaching because you've done it for so long. long. Uh, we're running. <laughs> we're running a little low on time, but I had one more. Uh, deep, I guess, deep question. For you before we wrap this up these days what are some things that keep you going that just inspire you to get up inspire you to do better inspire you to be nicer that, if that, you that, are inspired to do these things <laughs> I, I believe you are that's all it's always what an interesting you question you know it, it because that is a question that you know one can ask themselves every day you know, it's like, why should I get out of bed today? You know, <laughs> a lot of times it's, well, they won't pay me. And that means this, these, these sets of dominoes start falling over, you know, um, and, and that's okay. You know, I used to feel guilty about that. I was working for a, a photo lab, uh, for about two years, I think, uh, somewhere in those twenties. And, um, uh, I remember <laughs> every morning I had to wake up and go, do I really want to show up for work today? Really? You know, and it wasn't anything personal about that. They were nice. The guy, the guy that owned the place was really nice to me, you know, but it was just like, really? I have to drive around to all these places to deliver these, you know, all this stuff. And, and it was like, yeah, cause you got to pay rent, you know, and it's okay. You know, sure. We'd love to be able to spring out of bed and, you know, go off to our, fulfilling lives but you know it's all it's all of a balance in there and when we say balance it's not balanced in in favor of ecstasy and utopia it's balanced in in favor of 
you take the good and the bad together, you know. And if I think the hard part is when we take this, the, the periods of time that are more frustrating and we convert them into forever, right? Where we say, oh man, it's going to go on like this forever. Well, it could. <laughs> it actually could. Um, but you do have some control of that, you know. You, you can find ways. I mean, I went through periods of time where I was, I just had to be happy doing what I was doing and worry about the, you know, the big plans and the long-term, you know, success and, you know, hoopla and all that stuff. Had to worry about it later or take little steps, right? It's like, you know, it's one thing when you're used to doing your homework and you can do it all in one setting. Like you write a paper and you can write it all in one setting and you kind of go, why, why should I do research? I'm just going to wait till the end, you know, because I, I know I can do that. And then you get the first bad grade on something that you did overnight and you're like, oh no, I'm a failure. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, it's like, well, no, you just have to learn how the stakes are higher now. So you have to like do more research. It's not better, but it throws you off because you weren't planning on it that way, you know, or that it's going to take a little longer to prepare this particular excerpt or this particular solo or, you know, for your lesson even, right? I Normally, I can just sit down an hour before and crank out these, you know, etudes. I can't do that anymore. It's like, yeah, that's right. So, so to answer your question directly, if I, I found that it's easier for me to enjoy the variety of life if uh, in, in the, the good and the bad and you know if, if I realize that there's some things I can control and some things I can't and if I can just be okay with that not it doesn't mean I have to live with everything it does mean I can push on certain things or you know ask questions about the things that I don't like or, or that aren't going my way what can I do to make them better right but if I decide that everything has to happen all at once or it has to happen in the way that I'm the most happiest with, right? Then I'm always going to be disappointed. Sometimes, and I, I love this saying, and I, it wasn't mine. I didn't make it up. Um, but I like to I, I like to remember this, and especially at times when things are just kind of grinding along. It's like, you know, glacial speed is still progress. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it may not, it, things may be moving forward, you know, so slowly that you can't tell, but they're still moving forward. You know, if you give a glacier enough time, it's going to take over, right? It's going to do stuff. And so I would prefer not to move at glacial speed, but sometimes progress is like that. So when I'm practicing something and I'm really having, like right now I'm working on a couple things and they're just going really slowly and it's driving me nuts. But my experience now and the frustration that I felt in previous times like this have allowed me to kind of still be frustrated, but also to develop a little more patience that I, I can work this out. You know, I just need some more time, more time than I want. Fine. I can still do it. So, you know, if I can approach life like that, it's actually pretty easy to get out of bed and do stuff. Because today, you know, I might want to do this much, but if I even do this much, it's okay. And sometimes there's nothing. And okay, tomorrow I'll try again, you know. But it also helps to have projects, you know, and to have things that I'm working on. And to be patient with uh, uh, and, and have a healthy perspective on short-term goals versus long-term goals. And if I can keep that in balance... Life's pretty, pretty cool, you know, but I also have decided that life is supposed to have ups and downs. <laughs> it's not supposed to be just one trajectory to happiness, you know, it's like sometimes it really sucks. And that it, because, because I have made it through times that really sucked, it's easy for me to say, you know, it'll be all right. We have to live through them though. We have to go to those depths and make our way through them somehow to understand better how to weather them. 
you know part of the biggest issue about pandemics is that it's been a long time since our country has been through a pandemic right and so everybody's kind of groping for experiences that they can relate to this and in one way we can't right but in other ways we can look at other hardships that we've had or restrictions or limiting factors or stuff that we don't have any control over and we can remember how we've made it through them and take some solace at least that we have survived right and we that doesn't mean it's going to be easy or that we can't we don't pay attention to the daily kind of grind way through it but it can give us some solace some level of confidence that we can survive this and that's why it's difficult for people who have not had those experiences yet to understand that and to to resist the urge to freak out so that's where <laughs> that's where we're supposed to pay attention to our elders who have lived through pain and agony you know i mean whatever um this is how we figure it out that's all you know i don't know if that answered your question directly but you know uh it answered it in your own way yeah which is exactly why i wanted to have you on so it's perfect we'll go all well, dr Seneca, we're think... here, but we're gonna go this way and then we're gonna come back here <laughs> <laughs> no 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 it's it's uh it's always a fun journey to talk with someone like that where we're gonna you know we're gonna fly around and hit all these different spots and then we'll come back to the where yeah. we originally intended well, to go but it's I we learned I some stuff along the way I, I spend a lot of time kind of trying to compare the big picture with the little picture you know and the problem is is that that since I'm the one sort of doing all the thing sometimes it's hard to follow are we doing the big picture now or now we now that's the small you know and, and and now we're doing this you know so i understand <laughs> no no it's great welcome to history lectures oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well thank you so much for joining me um this was really fun um maybe we'll do this again at some point we will see uh to those who listened if if there any anyone did listen Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, remember, love is the answer. Stay healthy. <laughs> Stay healthy. Keep trying stuff you're afraid of. All that stuff. Uh, embrace the chaos. Embrace it. And be well, everybody. Thanks again, Dr. Snedeker. You bet. Good words to live by. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thanks.